A couple of weeks ago, I was trolling around eBay, and I found this. And I know, it's not much to look at, just a couple pieces of oak, but look a little closer. This thing is clearly a tool. Those shapes are careful and deliberate, and there are a lot of interesting tool marks. The seller listed this as a marking gauge, but it's not that. The price was $10, plus shipping, and I snapped it right up. But why? Why did I throw down $25 for some random scraps of oak? Because I know what this thing really is. If you've done any amount of hand tool woodworking, you have used winding sticks. They're just a pair of very flat, straight sticks of wood. If you want to test a board for flatness, you put these sticks at either end, close one eye, and look over the top. As you move your head down, the far stick disappears behind the one that's close to you. If it disappears evenly, the board is flat. But if either end sticks up, the board is out of flat. Sometimes this condition is referred to as wind, thus winding sticks. Once you've made a set of winding sticks and learned how to use them, there is nothing else to know. Unless you've read André Roubaud's 1774 treatise on furniture making. Yeah, Roubaud liked the workbench. That guy. Right here, at the top of engraving number 14, is something that should look awfully familiar. These are Roubaud's winding sticks. And if you've used the standard English or American ones, these French ones are a bit of a head-scratcher. I mean, why are they on stilts? Well, if you've got a really ugly piece of rough timber, your regular winding sticks aren't as useful. There's nowhere flat to put them. But Roubaud's sticks allow you to measure specific points on your piece of wood. Those stilts can be placed in the low spots, and they hold the sticks up where they can bridge the high spots. With these more precise sticks, you can locate the lowest, flattest points on your piece, and then plane away everything else. This is a whole different way of using the tool. But wait a second. Am I honestly suggesting that I found an artifact from the 1700s while I was screwing around on eBay? Well, maybe. This thing is made of oak. It is exactly like the winding sticks in Roubaud's engraving. And there's a lot of other details. It's got a lot of interesting tool marks. I mean, really interesting ones. There are all kinds of arcs and circles that have been scribed into the surface with a pair of dividers. These are clear indicators of a pre-industrial craftsman at work. And then there's also the surface of the tool. It's just extremely slick and shiny, like varnish, but there's no finish on it. Oak gets like this if it's being handled every day, but it takes a really long time. Now, I can't say for certain that these date back to Roubaud's era, but what I can say is that they're in Roubaud's book, and he talks about some very interesting ways to use them. So far, I've just scratched the surface. We need to make a set of these. I'm using walnut for this build, mostly because I have some good scraps. This long piece will be perfect for the beams. It's already straight, and the end grain shows that it's nearly quarter sawn, which is great for stability. My other piece will make the feet, and I'm choosing it for its density and dark color. Step one is to get the pieces cut and squared. My advanced shooting board is designed to hold long pieces for sawing and shooting. I'm just cutting away knots and damaged wood and leaving myself as much stock as possible. As I make each cut, I'll shoot the end square right away. Combining operations like this saves time. After just a few minutes, my beams are the correct length, and they have neat, square ends. These components need to be very square, so I'm carefully flattening one surface with a smoothing plane. I'm using one of my traditional winding sticks as a straight edge. You can just use a common ruler. Anything straight will do the job. Now I'll make one edge exactly perpendicular to that face. Then I'll mark my face and edge. For the rest of the project, I'll only reference my square off these two known surfaces. Using that perfectly flat face as a reference, I'll gauge lines down the side for the final thickness of the piece. I'm using my homemade marking gauge, which you can make from a few scraps and a nail. It works just as well as one you'd buy. I have to take off about 3 eighths of an inch of material, which is tricky. It's too narrow to saw, but planing it down could take forever. This is why you need a dedicated plane for heavy stock removal. My scrub plane has a wide mouth and a curved iron that takes big bites. This plane lets me quickly cut bevels down to my gauge lines. Now, all my extra material is in the middle of the board, and I've got easy visual references on either side. 
Cleaning away the unwanted wood is a lot faster than you'd think. When you go to rip your beams to width, double check that you're not cutting away the reference edge. I'm using this Baco saw, and I'll do a complete review next month, but I really like it. This saw works out of the box with no tuning. It's inexpensive and it's resharpenable. I will link to it down in the description. When I move the work up in the vise, there's a lot of danger from vibration and splitting. So I just take my free hand and pull gently toward myself as I cut. My arm absorbs that vibration, and I can work faster because I have more of the wood sticking out of the vise. After you plane off the worst of the saw marks, place your beams with the reference edges down on a clean part of the bench. Once they're lined up, all the inaccuracies will be along that top edge. Once you've planed it parallel to the reference edge, your beams are finished. At this point, you have a pair of perfectly functional winding sticks. You could call it a day right now, but really, Let's have a sense of adventure. Preparing the stock for the feet is the same thing. Get a face and an edge squared up, scrub down to thickness, smooth your surfaces, and rip to width. Then you can cut two pieces to length and shoot the ends square. At this point, you might want some measurements, and I have a complete set of plans based off careful measurements from the original antique winding stick. I'll talk about those plans later in the video. We're gonna take those two medium length pieces of walnut we just made and make them into the feet. Now, these feet have this little arc detail right here in the bottom, and we could carve that, but there's a much more efficient way to get it done. I've got a center line drawn across the width of my piece, and now I just need to find the center side to side. Luckily, a common marking gauge makes a great center finder. Just eyeball the correct measurement, reference the gauge off the edge, and make a little tick in the wood. Then, come in from the other side and do the same thing. If your two marks don't land in the same place, you can micro-adjust your gauge by just tapping it on the bench. When you hit the same spot from both sides, press your gauge firmly and roll it a little bit. That gives you a nice little starting point to guide your drill. Bore carefully through from both sides to get a clean hole. When you saw down that center line, you'll get a nice arc in the bottom of each foot. Stack the pieces carefully together and shoot the feet. These are your contact points with the wood, and they need to be square and clean. I want each set of feet to be identical, so I'll super glue them together using tiny dots of glue, mostly in places that I plan to cut off later. While the glue is still wet, I'll align the pieces using the reference edges and the bottoms that I just squared up. The glue only takes a few minutes to set, and I'm ready to mortise. I can do most of the mortise layout with a little square and my Stockman knife. You can see I have a little triangle across one set of edges. These are my reference edges, and the triangle will let me put them back together in exactly the same position if I ever need to. We don't have a mortising gauge in our basic Woodwork for Humans toolkit, but you really don't need one. Once you have your top and bottom lines scribed, you can just come in with the marking gauge and strike a single line on each face. That's all you really need to guide the chisel. Just make sure that you keep your chisel edge tight against that one line as you chop the mortise. This is delicate work. So take small bites and tap gently. With the pieces glued together, you can chop in from both faces so you won't blow out the inside. I never tried to do this to two pieces at once like this, but it worked great. The little arc on the top of the feet is mostly decorative, so you can trace any round object you like. Chiseling a tight curve like this across end grain isn't gonna work. The wood is certainly going to split. So I'll come in with my fine Dazuki saw and cut away most of the waste before switching to a file and dialing in the curve. Once I have all the curves roughed in, I'll line all the pieces up in the vise and work on all four at once. This gives me a longer surface and I can take straighter cuts with the file. While I was working these in the vise, the super glue let go all by itself and the pieces came apart cleanly. This technique is a winner. Now, I need to fit the beams to the feet. I want them to slide freely but the fit should be precise, not sloppy. I intentionally left the beams a little fat in both dimensions, so I can do most of my fitting by planing on the non-reference face and edge. Ideally, you would do all of your fitting this way, but my mortises aren't perfect and they need a little trim too. My last step is to test the whole setup on a known flat surface. This piece of melamine is just a shelf from some throwaway IKEA furniture, but it's dead flat. When you look over the top of your sticks and dip your head, the far stick should disappear all at once behind the near stick. If something isn't level, you need to look at the bottoms of the feet, the bottoms of the mortises, and the straightness of the lower edge of the beam. 
These are the variables. Mine is dead straight. So I'm done. Okay, here's why we went to all that trouble. This board is very roughly cut, and it was outside for a little while, so the surface is quite wavy. Standard, straight winding sticks won't register very well because there's no flat surface for them. These French winding sticks only register on the feet, so I can set them into the low spots and move them around until I find a couple of low spots that are all more or less level. I leave these spots alone while I plane away the rest of the surface. Then I can retest and move the sticks around to check different areas. Once I'm done, the board isn't perfectly smooth, but it is flat and it's ready for the next stage of processing. Oh, and that face I'm making, the thing, you, you have to do that. That is a period correct cabinet maker's lip curl. No, seriously, it's in the book. And the book also gives us a very interesting way to use these winding sticks. This piece of reclaimed pine has a very rough surface. I can tell that by eye, but I check it with the sticks anyway. This board doesn't have any low spots that are all in the same plane, so I'm gonna have to make some. Here's my homemade rabbit plane, and I'm gonna use it to cut a ledge all along either side of the board. Then I'll bring my sticks back in to make sure these two rabbits are in the same plane. They're not, so I trim out a little in the middle. After a bit of fiddling, I get both rabbits straight and level with one another. Now I have a perfect reference surface on either side of the board. Once you've got that, the rest is simple. Just scrub away the material between your two rabbits, and then take a few passes down the center of the board. My winding sticks tell me the board is level, but it's easy to be fooled. You also have to check that the board is flat across the middle, and this one isn't. It takes another pass with the scrub, and then a fairly heavy pass with the smoother to really flatten things out. Then you get something really nice. A board that's flat and straight. Once I work the other sides, this thing is ready to go into a project. These sticks work great, but they're a little plain. Let's dress them up a bit. I scraped all the surfaces, sanded all the curves, and coated everything in boiled linseed oil. This finish makes walnut turn a lovely chocolate brown color, but all that darkness makes the tools a little hard to use because both sticks kind of blend together. So I cut off the top of one stick and replaced it with a strip of sugar maple. This is a nearly white wood that won't darken over time. When I use this as the far stick, the top edge is super easy to see, and the sticks work much better. Of course, you don't have to go through all the trouble of adding a contrasting wood if you don't want to. Just make your winding sticks out of a light colored wood, and then you can just color in one edge with a magic marker. These are the first winding sticks I ever made. They're made out of sapele, and I just took a sharpie and ran a line right along this one. It works great. I've never had the slightest urge to mess with these. Now, another thing Rubo suggests is that we put pins on both sides of the beam to keep the feet attached. I've added one pin on the end. I made it out of brass because it looks really cool with the walnut, and I've only done one. This way, when I'm walking around the shop, the feet can't fall off onto the floor. But if I want to have just regular traditional winding sticks, well, I can pull the feet off, and then I've got a pair of regular sticks that work on flatter lumber. There's no reason to make multiple sets of these tools because you can have one set that works both ways. And projects like this are a great little skill builder because they teach you all kinds of things you need for real furniture making. You have to size your components, establish reference faces and edges, create smooth surfaces, shoot ends, you have to chop mortises, fit things together. These are all skills that transfer directly to furniture making. So if you're just kind of warming up for your first hand tool furniture project, a little project like this can be a great warm up. Now, something like this also has a lot of angles and measurements and arcs and stuff like that. So I have got a complete set of plans. They are very affordable. And right now I am running a 50% off sale on all of my plans, even my big plan bundles. So you can save half off of everything just for the month of December. You can check that out at rexkruger.com store or click the link down in the description. I also want to shout out this edition of Rubo's Text on Furniture. This was made by Lost Art Press. They have produced the definitive English translation, I think actually the only English translation. And the book is fairly expensive, but it's completely worth it. I learned a lot from reading this. I still look at it all the time. I get nothing if you buy this book, but I still think you should buy it, and I will link to it down in the description. 
I also want to mention that this is the last video I'm going to be doing for 2020. I'm going to take the next two weeks off, which is something that I haven't done since I started this channel almost five years ago. So I think I'm due for a little break. I'm going to spend some time with my family. I'm going to sit around watching The Mandalorian like the rest of the world and basically just try to relax. Of course, I'll be down here in the shop doing a little bit here and there anyway. I mean, this is the way. And, you know, I only get to take a vacation because of my patrons on Patreon. We have a great arrangement. They give me a couple dollars a month, and in return, I give them early access to all of my videos, all of my plans for free, exclusive content, and access to the friendliest, most welcoming discussion forum on the entire internet. It's a great deal for both of us. If you'd like to get in on it, go on over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger, and you can look at the different membership levels I have. Pick the one that works for you. So look, the holidays are almost upon us, and it's a relief. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be getting to the end of the year. It's been a great year, and you all have made that possible. Happy holidays. Thanks for watching.